So, good afternoon, everyone. Today we have uh, Bhaskar Mitra as our invited speaker. So, Bhaskar is a principal applied scientist at Microsoft AI and Research uh, at uh, Montreal, Canada. And uh, Bhaskar's main uh, research focus is in uh, applying deep learning for information retrieval. So, he's pretty active in uh, neural information retrieval and neural learning to rank. And uh, the topic for today's talk is using neural learning to rank approaches for information discovery. So recommender systems and other information discovery approaches. And uh, Bhaskar, thanks a lot for uh, uh, taking time to give an invited talk. So this talk is in two parts. So the first part will be today and the second part will be on next Tuesday. Thanks, Surya. Um, first of all, big thanks for inviting me to give this talk in the first place. Um, a second quick point, this is actually my, uh, I know giving uh, uh, lectures over Zoom is now the new thing. This is the first time I'm doing this uh, over Zoom. So please feel free to let me know if I'm doing something wrong during the course of this talk, uh, please feel free to interrupt me and let me know. Uh, and in general, I just um, also wanted to just kind of mention in the beginning, we'll have a, a couple of checkpoints where we can take questions, but please feel free to interrupt me even during uh, any of the uh, even during the course of this lecture at any point. If you have any questions, just interrupt me. I think we should be pretty good on time. Um, but in case we are running short on time, I'll let you know, but otherwise just uh, feel free to make this interactive and ask questions. Um, so a couple of uh, topics uh, that we are primarily going to focus on today. So Surya actually told me that uh, most of you should be quite familiar with the kind of the fundamentals of neural network and um, gradient descent and those kind of algorithms. So, but I still wanted to do um, a super quick uh, recap of some of the fundamental topics in that area. I think it's always good to make sure that everybody's kind of uh, starting from the same place and using the same vocab or whatnot. Uh, and then the second part of it is specifically going to be focusing on um, learning to rank in the context of information retrieval, which um, I personally have mostly worked on search, not so much as recommender systems, uh, but I think the, uh, the formulation for learning to rank, whether it be search or be recommendation is actually quite similar. So I think it should uh, generalize to whatever the, your favorite area of topic is, whether it's search or recommender system or something else. Um, a lot of the, uh, actually all of the content that I am uh, presenting today is uh, actually kind of derived from a bigger, uh, lectures uh, that uh, Nick Craswell and I have had started when back in 2000. Ooh, I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, wherever, whenever Wisdom was in Cambridge, it was a few years ago, four years ago, maybe more, four or five years ago. Um, or maybe, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I have, uh, if anybody is interested, so today we are mostly just talking about fundamentals of neural networks and learning to rank. Um, but if, uh, and next week, uh, I haven't decided the exact topics yet, but that's going to go into a bit more into deep learning um, models. Uh, but there is a broader set of topics that we would just because of time constraints, we are not going to be covering today or even possibly next week. Uh, so if you, if anybody's interested, I'm happy to point you to uh, a broader set of slides that we've had that we've now been kind of reusing um, in different tutorials and so on. Uh, and a lot of those slides eventually made into this manuscript that Nick and I ended up writing. Uh, which kind of talks about information retrieval, specifically search, uh, from the lens of deep learning and neural network models. Um, so pretty much a lot of the references here is from this book. If you want to uh, follow up reading material, uh, feel free to just grab the PDF. It's available free online, so feel free to grab it. Uh, I'll make these slides uh, available to everybody. I'll talk to Surya to figure out how what's the best way so uh, you can find the URL and link from uh, the slides when they're shared. So why are we talking about uh, learning to rank today, right? So why are we talking about ranking? Uh, and again, this is some of these things are going to be super obvious to everybody, but it's just still, I'm just going to talk through it. Uh, so if you think of pretty much any information retrieval systems, um, one of the most common user interface 
in retrieval system is to present some sort of a ranking, a rank list of items that you've retrieved. Uh, and this is true for, obviously, for search, where you might have, for example, a search page that looks like this, where you could have all the web links in a, in a nicely sorted uh, ordered list of web results. Uh, but then even if you think on other things on the web page, so for example, maybe uh, some kind of structured information retrieval that's going up here, it's again, actually a rank list, it just happens to be horizontal. Or if you think of, for example, uh, recommender systems like, for example, movie recommendation in Netflix, or in, on Amazon, uh, people also buy, people who view this item also view or also buy other items. Uh, again, you see a very similar kind of interface. Uh, same thing with YouTube recommendation or for search. Uh, same for Spotify and uh, whatnot. Um, and even if you think of like uh, beyond potentially just search and recommender systems, a uh, bit more maybe uh, other kind of IR applications. So for example, let's say query auto completion. Again, you generally given a prefix, uh, you would have a rank list of qu uh, completed queries or a rank list of uh, suffixes uh, for query auto completion. So uh, this notion of a rank list is like a very popular uh, kind of a user interface for most retrieval systems, right? Uh, so what is learning to rank? So learning to rank is uh, nothing but uh, you assume that you're given a data set, a training data set, and your goal is to uh, automatically construct a ranking model such that given uh, during inference time, given a new set of uh, user intent uh, and some collection of items, you're able to sort those items automatically based on their degrees of relevance or some other kind of preference or importance, right? Um, so for example, in the case of search, uh, you might wanna sort your documents based on how relevant they are to the query, but you might also wanna sort the document based on uh, other factors like, for example, what is the quality of the document, how popular is the document. So let's see if you have multiple documents uh, that satisfy the same query intent or is relevant to the same query, you might further want to uh, sort them based on other criteria like document popularity and uh, whatnot, right? So that's the really the basic idea of learning to rank. Um, I wanted to do a, a quick shameless plug in the very beginning. So if any of you are really interested in getting your, uh, getting some hands-on mm -hmm. experience or mm -hmm. There's a bit of feedback on the call, I'm not sure who's. All right. um, I was just gonna say, so yeah, so if anybody's interested in kind of uh, getting a bit more practical experience, uh, this the best way is obviously always to go uh, find some data sets and actually trying out what you learn. Uh, if you are interested in uh, search or recommender systems, for recommender systems, uh, I would probably say like look out for things like Rex's challenge. Uh, for search, one of the go-to thing is typically uh, the text retrieval conference or TREC that has been running for quite a few years now. Um, and last year, me, Nick Craswell, Emine, and Dan uh, the four of us organized a deep learning track track, uh, which by deep learning here, the main idea was that uh, this was a typical search uh, scenario, but you had a lot of uh, training data that was made available to you. Uh, so we are also planning to run the same thing again this year. Um, so if anybody's interested, go figure out, uh, go look at this link or ping me and I'm happy to uh, point you to the right resources um, uh, on firm to get started with. Uh, Trek style uh, evaluation. Okay, so let's get started with the actual content at this um, quickly. So yeah, so the first half of this uh, lecture, I'm pretty much going to go through some pretty basic fundamentals of neural networks. Um, if this becomes like stuff that everybody is super familiar with, feel free to just let me know. I don't know if, is there a chat window here over here that I should be monitoring or um, do people just typically ask questions just over audio? What's the norm? So in the past, people have uh, asked questions by unmuting themselves. All right, perfect. That that works for me. I, I just wanted to check because I don't have any chat window or anything open, so I might miss any messages. Just feel free to ask questions. But also, if you think that some of the topics I'm covering is like, yep, we all know this, 
we can go ahead quicker let me know and i'm happy to go uh, go through faster uh, but obviously if it's also if something is not clear please stop me and let's make this a bit more interactive as much as possible um a lot of uh, pretty much everything that we're going to talk about uh, in terms of math uh, it really just requires you to have some the basics of linear algebra um i think everything on this slide should be super familiar to everybody um uh, if the moment you start thinking about uh, these different kind of neural toolkits my favorite way of thinking about them is effectively uh, a set of tensors and tensor operations right so just be kind of uh, familiar with those concepts um so by again as somebody who originally started off as uh, on 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 code as a coder and as, as a developer um, i still kind of like look at the math and kind of potentially like translate them to data structures so so a, a tensor is nothing more than an n dimensional array uh, if the n here is 2 then it becomes a matrix if it is more than 2 then typically you call it a tensor if it's a single dimensional array then you just call it a vector and obviously if you have a single item then you just call it a scalar right uh, and then in terms of maths like simple things like just knowing what a matrix transpose uh, matrix transposes or matrix addition matrix multiplication dot product these are like if you know these every, everything else you should be able to follow uh, for the next hour so that should be good uh, this is a, a visual representation of what scalar vector matrix and tensors look like anyways <laughs> Uh, okay, so so learning, supervised learning. So all of the discussions today is primarily going to focus on uh, machine learning in a supervised setting. Uh, so in this setting, the idea is really simple. So you have a learning system. So this is your model, which has a bunch of learnable parameters, uh, and your goal is to learn those uh, the value of those parameters given some kind of training, some training data. A training data typically consists of uh, a set of inputs and expected output pairs. Um, the slight variance of that, but let's make that assumption for now. So the a typical cycle in uh, supervised learning looks like this. So you have input training data. So you feed that uh, input uh, through the learning system and then you get the predicted output. And then for each of those inputs, you, um, as I said, you already are also provided the expected output or the desired output in this case. So you can compare the uh, predicted output or the actual output of the model with the desired or the expected output. Uh, and then you can compute some form of an error. And then you use that error information to go update the parameters uh, of the model. And then you do the same process, you repeat the same process over and over till your model gives you good performance or you you get to convergence right so that's the very simple um, one diagram discussion of supervised learning so what does a model really look like here right so in case of neural networks uh, a, a general way to think about neural networks is uh, so your the model input is a vector uh, or potentially it could be some kind of n dimensional tensor um, and a typical neural model is a sequence of linear and nonlinear uh, transformations right so what what do i mean by linear and nonlinear transformation uh, a linear transformation would be to take for example the input vector or tensor uh, and then let's say you can multiply it with some uh, uh, another tensor which is actually the tensor of learnable parameters um, generally we call it a weight uh, so you can multiply it with the weight matrix or a weight tensor uh, or you could let's say and you could add um, another uh, uh, you could add another tensor or a vector, which is typically what we would call a bias, right? So uh, multiplying, multiplication, addition of some par other learnable parameters. So that is what we would typically say is a linear transformation. Um, and then nonlinear transformation examples of that would be um, something like doing element-wise tan H or element-wise uh, ReLU function. Uh, so I have a couple of like this to give you guys visual idea what a tan H function looks like or a ReLU looks like. So this is the for the x is the input and y what would be the corresponding output for uh, for these kind of not different non-linearities uh, again i'm assuming that everybody here is super familiar with these topics so i'm going to kind of breeze through these two these topics very quickly uh, and if something is not clear please feel free to uh, stop me and ask me questions so yeah so if you want to if you have a model that looks like this uh, so you have let's say uh, two layer two, la two layers of 
uh, interleaving linear and nonlinear transformation, which gives you the predicted output. Then just as in the previous slide, uh, for every input in the training data, you know what the expected output is going to be, right? Uh, and you get the predicted output by going forward, doing the forward pass through the model. So then you can compute the loss or the error signal. And then you do the backward pass where you go through the model and then you update all the parameters based on that error. Uh, and we'll, we'll actually walk through what that looks like for a very, very simple neural model in a couple of slides. Um, so in terms of machine learning tasks, again, there are uh, kind of broadly the kind of tasks people think about is regression, classification, ranking. Um, we'll talk a little bit about regression classification very quickly. And we will use whatever we discuss in the context of regression and classification to then talk about ranking. So if you kind of pay attention um, about these topics in the beginning, even if they seem very simple, um, it's actually gonna help with the discussion in the later part of uh, this hour, uh, where we are basically gonna just reuse those concepts and then everything is just, should hopefully uh, fall in place. Okay, so regression, again, just a quick reminder. So what does a regression task look like? So you have an input um, feature vector, uh, and then you have your model, and the model produces a one or, 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 or a vector of uh, real valued numbers. And then the expectation is, again, the, the expected output are, is also a real valued number. Uh, so you are trying to uh, train the model such that the predicted, the, these real valued numbers are as close as possible to these expected real valued numbers, right? Um, in comparison, let's say if you have classification, so this is an example of binary classification, so you just have two classes. Uh, so here, you do, uh, what the model produces, uh, and we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, so for now, let's assume uh, for a given input in classification task, a model would typically produce the probability uh, corresponding to each of the classes, right? And we'll talk about how, the, how does a model produce probability, but we'll get to that in a slide. Uh, but the idea here is that you generate these probability distribution over the candidate classes, and then the expected output uh, in this case, where, where um, let's say in binary classification, only one of the two classes is true, right? So the prob expected probability distribution is one for one of the classes and zero for the other. And in this case, unlike regression, you don't care as much about the absolute value of these probability distribution and how they differ from this, what you really care about is if you were to pick the best, the class with the highest predicted probability, how often is that class the right class, right? So what you really care about is something like potentially like um, precision, accuracy, recall, those kind of metrics, not necessarily uh, whether your probability uh, distribution, how it compares with the expected probability. Uh, so, and we'll, but, but we'll talk about that in the, in under loss functions in a slide or two. Okay, so for regression tasks, one of the most common form of uh, loss function is a simple squared loss. So uh, the squared loss is again, so is, it's a really, really simple uh, loss function. So let's assume that your model uh, produces a vector of numbers. Uh, which is here in this case, uh, this function f of xqd. So assume this is a vector and yqd is um, another vector. Ignore the qd, I clearly copied this uh, <laughs> equation from somewhere where there was a notion of query document, but we can ignore that for now. Uh, but yeah, so basically the go, uh, ideal output is y, uh, which is which can be a vector. And then the this is the predicted vector. Uh, and then you're doing the squared error is just, Element wise, you find the difference, take a square and then sum it over the vector length, right? So that's a simple uh, squared loss function. Okay, uh, in the next two slides, I'm gonna quickly talk about uh, softmax and cross entropy. Uh, and again, I'm just kind of touching up on these topics just to make sure everybody's uh, aware. Um, so bear with me if these topics uh, look like I'm just kind of like, you know, there's a bit of a discontinuity where I'm just touching up on slightly different but related topics. Uh, okay, so softmax function. So what is a softmax function and why do we need it? So let's start with the why. So in case of classification, we talked about uh, that uh, we our model produces a probability distribution over the classes, right? But, uh, but we don't know how, to, how a model can produce probability. A model, uh, typically, if you take an input, multiply it with some weight metrics and add 
wet metrics, uh, bias vectors and whatnot, uh, you end up with some, uh, again, real valued numbers that comes out of the model. So how do I go from those real valued numbers to probability? Um, a typical trick is to do the, uh, is, to, is to apply the softmax function. So what does the softmax function do? So let's assume that your model output was these four real valued numbers. So notice that the y-axis here is not bounded. Uh, in fact, these numbers could also have been negative. It just I, in this example, they all happen to be positive, but they could easily be negative numbers. Uh, so the uh, a softmax function, all it does is it takes an exponent of each of them individually. So e to the power of this value, uh, same thing with this and this and this. Uh, and then it normalizes uh, that value by taking a sum of the exponents of all the values. So this is exactly what this equation shows, right? So if let's say z of, uh, if you imagine this vector is z, then z of zero is this number. Uh, so what you would do is you would take e power this value and then divide it by the sum of e power each of these values like the summed up version, right? So two things happen here, just intuitively, there are a couple of things that happens when you apply the, um, the softmax function. So one is by taking an exponent, it guarantees that all of these numbers are gonna be positive, right? So even if you start up with some negative numbers or um, uh, and whatnot, you know that once you take the exponent, all of these numbers are gonna be positive. And then secondly, by doing this normalization, by adding, uh, by dividing by this value, you basically guarantee that the final output, uh, the, uh, the, the probability, the pseudo probability that you're effectively generating from this, all of these numbers, if you add them, it will sum up to one, right? Which is, and I call it a pseudo probability because you've effectively interpreted real valued numbers as, um, um, as probabilities, um, but yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so the, by doing the normalization, now you're guaranteed that this, all of these probably, all these per class numbers would add up to one. Uh, actually, the third thing I just wanted to mention here is that if you also look at these two diagrams uh, visually, notice that this one is a much more flatter curve, whereas this is a lot more peaky curve, right? So that's another thing that it does, which is if a model predicts four different scores for the four different classes in a classification task, the softmax will also amplify uh, the probability of the bigger class. So it will make the probability distribution much more peakier, which means that the model has to really pick one of the classes rather than just, you know, being kind of um, unsure and just giving almost equal probability to the different uh, uh, classes. Okay, so now let's talk about cross entropy. So cross entropy is a function that you typically use to compare uh, two different um, uh, probability distributions. So let's say you have four classes and then you have two probability distributions P and Q uh, over the same four classes uh, as shown in this diagram. So again, P individually, if you sum them up, they should sum up to one and so, so the same thing with Q. Uh, so cross entropy is uh, comparing these two probability distributions and the equation looks really as, it's a simple equation that looks like this, right? So it's PI log of QI and then you sum over all the classes. So in this case, there are four classes. Um, and remember that this is gonna be, an, uh, the, uh, this is, uh, QI is because it's a probability, so each of those would be less than uh, one. So it would be QI and PI, both would be in the range of zero to one. So when you take a log, this is gonna be a negative number. So there is a negative on the side, but then the cross entropy value is always positive because there's a negative that you would get from the log of a number that's less than one. Um, for classification tasks where you assume that only one of the classes is positive, uh, for any given input sample. Uh, it means that the expected probability, which is PI, uh, is one for the correct class and zero for everything else, for the other three classes in this case, right? Uh, so, so not like this diagram. This diagram is not typically what you would have. Um, so that means that if you look at now this equation, it means that if you look at the sum, it actually gets simplified because PI is zero uh, unless I corresponds to the correct class. So all the items that you are summing over, all of those components, all of them become zero except the one which corresponds to the correct class. And for that PI is one. So for that particular class, you, you just basically have log QI left. So a, a simple way of writing C, the cross entropy between P and Q, assuming P is true for only one of the classes, is you can just write minus log Q corresponding to the correct class, 
right? So that's it's what it becomes in a very simplified form. So why did we just talk about cross entropy and softmax? Uh, because uh, that's pretty much what you need to train a model in case of a classification task. So again, kind of going back to that description, you have a model uh, with some input vector and then the output vector uh, is uh, basically, so uh, if you have N classes, then you have N different real valued numbers or scores that the model is outputting. And then you apply the softmax function on top uh, to convert those uh, real valued numbers into a pseudo probability distribution, right? Um, so that's what you get from the softmax function. And then once you have that, you also know the ground truth in the training data, which is the expected probabilities, which I, as I said earlier, is one for one of the classes and will be zero for everything else. Um, obviously, which class is true will depend on the input, but for any given input, this is true. Uh, so then to compare these two things, you would do cross entropy loss that we just talked about in the previous, uh, uh, previous slide, right? So if you now take the, uh, so remember that in this Q, of the correct class, this is coming from the softmax function. So if you now combine the cross entropy and softmax, then your uh, cross entropy with softmax loss, as it is commonly called, basically looks like this. So it's minus log of Q of the correct class, where Q of the correct class is given by the softmax, which is e to the power of the uh, correct score, the score corresponding to the correct class divided by sum of this thing, right? So hopefully this much is clear. I'm just gonna quickly check Anybody has any questions so far? I assume silence means uh, no. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about gradient descent. So, so we already talked about, we looked at the diagram for supervised training. It's exactly the same thing. I'm just kind of adding a little bit more details and going like, you know, <laughs> in the neural world, like just layer by layer, I'm just like rip, ripping it off, but more, less of neural nets, but more of maybe the analogy should be an onion of layers. Anyways, um, so gradient descent, what, what do we do? We start with the training data, um, and then your training data consists of a bunch of, let's say, X and Y pairs, where X is the input and Y is the expected output. Uh, you define your model with some uh, set of model parameters. Initially, you just uh, initialize all the parameters randomly. Uh, then what you do is you do this process repeatedly where given some input X, you compute the model output. Then given the model output and the expected output Y, you compute some loss function, which could be like squared loss, could be cross entropy with softmax loss. We already know those uh, within, uh, we already know those topics because we just talked about them in the last few slides. Um, and so, so once you have the loss function, so now, uh, so which is your error signal? So now the question is, how do I go update the model based on the loss? So what you do is you compute for every parameter W in your model, you need to compute uh, the uh, gradient of the loss with respect to that parameter. So basically you need to uh, compute the derivative of the loss with respect to that individual parameter. And you do this for every parameter in your model. Um, but we'll talk about in a few slides how to do this in a very efficient way. Uh, so once you've computed this, uh, then you update the value of the parameter. So the parameter, remember, it already has some initial value, which let's say it's W old. Uh, so then you just update the W new. The new value of the parameter is going to be W old minus eta, which is a learning rate. It's a hyperparameter of your model that you set. Um, so let's leave, ignore that for a second. Uh, eta multiplied by this gradient of the loss with respect to this parameter. So it's, it's really simple, as simple as that. And then you keep doing this whole process, um, step two to step six. Uh, you just keep repeating this process till you get to convergence or you're, you're happy with your model training or you basically run out of GPU time and somebody needs to use that machine and it's gonna kick you out of the lab. So whichever comes first, right? Okay. Um, I wanted to do a super quick uh, kind of an oral exercise here uh, where what I, um, and I, I find this personally, I found this quite um, useful uh, to give me, even if I know all the math or the basics to just really give me confidence that I know what I'm talking about um, is to kind of run through a really simple neural network. Um, this neural network has a single um, hidden layer and a one, uh, I mean, 
output layers are all typically always one. So it basically has uh, the, this, uh, so everything here is basically the model, if you see my cursor. So this is my neural network. And for each layer, I have a single neuron, right? So I'm really making a very, very simple model. Uh, and what does my model look like? So first, given an X, X is a real valued number. So the input is actually a scalar. It's not even a vector or a tensor. I'm making it as simple as possible. My first operation is gonna be, I'm gonna multiply it with some parameter W1 and add V1. And then I'm gonna do a non-linearity. So I'm gonna use tan H in this case. Uh, and that gives me Y1. And then I'm gonna multiply it by another parameter W2 and add V2 and then do another tan H, which gives me Y2. And let's assume that Y2 is the final output of the model. Uh, and then for this input, I know the uh, ground truth, which is Y. Uh, so I can compute a loss. In this case, let's assume we are gonna do a squared loss. So we do just nothing but Y minus Y2 uh, whole square. Uh, and that's our loss, right? So now we've done the whole forward pass to the point of computing the loss function. So now it's time to update the parameters. So what are the learnable parameters of this model? So we have W1, B1, W2, and B2, right? So those are the four parameters we wanna learn. So let's focus on W1 because it's the same thing with the other parameters. You'll do it the same way. So, but let's just talk about one of them in details. So what you wanna compute is the gradient of the loss L with respect to the parameter W1, right? So we talked about this in the previous slide. You want to compute this thing. Uh, so, here, uh, what kicks in is, again, I'm assuming all of you are familiar with the chain rule, at least at a high level, you know what that means in case of a derivative. So the key idea here to notice is that the derivative of the loss with respect to W1, you can expand it by doing uh, the derivative of the loss with respect to Y2, multiplied by the derivative of Y2 with respect to Y1, and then multiplied by the derivative of Y1 with respect to W1. So I'm just using simple chain rule of derivation uh, to expand uh, the deriv this, this into these three parts, right? Uh, and I'm gonna just kind of flip through to further expand each of these things to show that it ends up being a very gnarly math, but the way you get to that is actually really, really simple and almost trivial. Right. So, for example, uh, let's start with this component first. So what is can I write loss with respect to Y2? Like, can I write it in that term, which is as simple as just putting plugging in this value here. So it becomes Y minus Y2 whole squared. If you differentiate that with respect to Y2, that gives you this this thing. Right. It doesn't matter what it actually looks like, but you know how to get there. So the, you do the same thing now, let's say with this. So you derive Y2 with respect to Y1. So first of all, you first write what Y2 is. Uh, which is tan H of W2 into Y1 plus B2. Uh, and then you derive, you do the derivative, which is again, a very simple function. Well, the derivative, you can, you know what the co normally common equations are. So it's, uh, you can plug that in and you get this. And last but not the least, you do the same thing with Y1 with respect to W1. So let's again, plug in what Y1 is. Uh, so that's this. You, d you do the derivation and then you get something. So you end up with this kind of gnarly looking math um, but the way to get to that actual equation, deriving it is actually kind of pretty straightforward if you think about it. Now, uh, I will talk about why, how different neural toolkits make this super simple so that you pretty much never have to actually worry about doing these derivations by hand unless you are coming up with a completely new uh, neural operation or a layer. Uh, then you would typically do this derivation, but otherwise, and even in that case, the derivation you do is kind of very bounded, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, so yeah, so once you know this whole thing that looks a bit gnarly, but notice that all of these things are actually like something you can plug in. So for this given X, you know what the Y is, what the Y2 was, what um, the act current value of W1, it's W2, B2, and all of those are, right? So you just plug in those numbers and this whole thing then just gives, you get the number, you get the actual value, a real valued number. So then you'd already also know what was the current value of W1, so you update it just the way we talked about it in the previous slide by this equation. So it's as simple as that. Now, uh, so just kind of a corollary. So because of time constraints, we are not gonna have time to actually go through this exercise. Uh, but if anybody's interested, uh, there is a, I have a Jupyter notebook uh, on at the link that's shown here, uh, which kind of does exactly the same thing as this experiment. Um, but what it does is it actually implements that really simple neural net. 
uh, with multiple layers, but only have a single neuron per layer. Uh, but it implements in the DAC model in two ways. It implements it using PyTorch, but it also implements exactly the same thing from scratch. So, and, and the structure of the implementation by scratch kind of follows a similar idea as uh, how PyTorch implements it behind the scene. So it just kind of helps to kind of see that the, what PyTorch is doing is actually not that complicated. It's actually really simple. It's just, in most cases, just a few lines of code. Um, so yeah, feel free to uh, check out this uh, particular notebook offline or after this uh, lecture. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ping me uh, offline via email or Twitter or whatever your favorite mode of um, communication is. Um, okay, uh, so, so this is a point where maybe it's a, go, um, a good time to kind of talk about, so how does all these neural toolkits uh, make this easy, right? So why, how, how, what is the secret sauce? So the main thing is to, um, the key component here is to realize that, uh, so if you think about, uh, if you let's go back to this diagram, right? So, oops, sorry. Uh, so let's say if you go back to this equation, uh, what is actually happening is that imagine if each of these nodes or each of these layers uh, implemented three different functions, okay? So the first function is that given the input to this layer, this layer should be able to compute the its output. Right, so that's, it just implements a forward function for this current layer. Uh, the second operation is that if the current layer has any learnable parameters, so for example, uh, let's say in this layer, uh, we have parameters W1 and B1, then it should be able to compute the gradient of its output, the output of that layer with respect to its own parameters. So Y1 with respect to W1, right? The other thing, uh, the third one, uh, that every layer needs to implement is to compute the gradient of its output with respect to its input. So that would be, for example, here for the second layer, uh, we have this component which uh, computes the gradient of Y2 with respect to Y1. Why are we talking about these three functions? Because typically the way you would, da, 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 da. yeah, so, oops, sorry. So typically the way, Am I on the right side? Yeah, okay. Uh, so typically the way uh, PyTorch or any of these of your favorite toolkits, what they do is they make the whole, um, they expose a certain set of modules uh, where each module think of it as a single neural layer uh, of, a, of different kinds. And for each of those implementations, uh, each of those layer implementations, they would have three different functions, the forward pass, and then for backward pass, it would know how to compute the gradient of the output with respect to its input and the gradient of the output with respect to its parameters. So as long as every layer implements these three functions, what it means is that you can chain these, oper these different layers in all, any or pretty much any arbitrary way. And then to actually compute the uh, gradient, so let's say for this one, all you do is you'd see, uh, so first of all, during back propagation, you would using the first function, uh, computing gradient of the layer output with respect to layer input, you can basically keep doing this down the street, right? So you can go all the way back to the input. Uh, and then for each of the layers that have parameters, it can also compute the gradient of its output with respect to those parameters. And that's all you need. Uh, those are the two things uh, you need as we saw in the equation before. Um, Again, if this is not clear, uh, let me know. We can chat maybe offline after the talk, especially if we look through maybe the Jupyter notebook that I referenced in the previous slide. I think this becomes super clear uh, what that interface looks like, right? But so once you've done this, uh, pretty much a lot of the work people do. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the order of this derivative doesn't matter. So we can like uh, do these steps arbitrary and then just plug it in to the formula, right? Exactly. So yes, so basically all you need is that, yeah, that's actually a very good point. So all of these three, three components, you could potentially compute them in parallel to save time and be efficient. Uh, but all you need is to finally compute this thing. You need to have all the three quantities available to you. Uh, but yes, all these three things are independent. So they like, you could do them in parallel um, and speed, uh, speed up your uh, computation. Uh, is that, was that a fair answer to the question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. 
Perfect. Awesome. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Okay. So let's move forward. So uh, I have a few quick slides before we get into the crux of the learning to rank. Uh, so quickly, um, just talking about, so why, why, why is all this craze about deep learning? Well, actually, that's a very bad question. I should not even try to answer that. But I, what I'm going to quickly try to address in the next few slides uh, is, an, is just to kind of build some intuition about why we think uh, depth helps. Now, I have to be very careful to make um, say something here, which is that why depth helps is a question that if you know uh, the um, the actual answer, then that's like a I don't know a Neuro's best paper or something, right? So there is a what I'm going to talk about is mostly different hypotheses that people have about why depth helps. Um, but it, there could be totally a different reason why it really helps and we can talk about it later. Okay, sorry, I, I let this thing running, but uh, that's okay, it was a video, but basically the idea was uh, one reason why depth potentially helps is that if you have a, a model that is more complex, then it is able to fit to a more uh, a complex function, right? So for example, in this case, what you're trying to do, this is a simple classification problem where you have two classes, the orange dots and the blue dots, uh, and each dot is represented by two feature, it's X and Y coordinates. And all it's showing is that if you have um, one layer, hidden layer versus three hidden layer, here you are able to learn a function uh, that's, that fits less well to the data. Whereas if you have three layers, then you can see, you can learn a very complex space uh, so here it's basically what the this coloring is telling you what the model is predicting. So you see that the model ends up learning something that actually looks like a spiral. Um, uh, in this, it is it, with more layers, it's able to fit a much more complex function. So that's one intuition, right? The other intuition uh, kind of relates to. Uh, but before we go there, let's just quickly talk about what bias and variance is. And again, I assume most of you are very familiar with this concept. Uh, so let's say uh, what I'm tr my what I'm trying to predict. Um, is the true value is somewhere here in the center. Uh, and for this particular task, I have uh, uh, trained, let's say, eight different models. So it's the exact same training data. Maybe I started with slightly different random initialization of the model uh, and whatnot. Uh, but let's say I have trained eight different models. So a variance is telling you how much, uh, uh, so variance is talking about how much variance do you see between the prediction of these eight different models, right? So how much difference do you see between uh, how the, what this eight different models predicts, uh, which if you think about it, if you think of each of these little blue dots as the prediction of the model uh, for each of the eight models or whatever number of models there are. So then variance is how much these dots are spread around in the space, in the prediction space, right? Uh, and bias is the uh, difference between what the models predict and what the expected um, value is. So bias is telling you uh, wherever the, however the dots may be spread around, but how far away are they spread from the center? So this is, for example, this one is low bias, low variance. This is low bias because it's still centered on the right thing, but it's kind of spread around. So low bias, high variance, here, this is, they're all very compact. So it's low variance, but very high bias because it's far away from the center. And then this one is spread around as well as um, um, it's far away from the center. So it's high bias and high variance. Uh, and what you typically want is this on, to be on the top left here, right? And this is the worst. Um, so one of the classical machine, in machine learning, one of the classical um, insight or intuition is that as you increase model capacity, which is what is on the x-axis, uh, so model capacity, think of it in terms of, for example, the number of learnable parameters or the number of layers um, of your model. Uh, so as you increase comp uh, uh, your model uh, complexity, we know that the model initially performs really poorly. So this is, by the way, y-axis is risk or loss. So lower is better. So, uh, and the dotted line is on the training data and the solid line is on the test data. So we know that the train on the training data, the more complex your model is, the better you would fit. So the less will be the loss, the better it is. But then on the test data, unseen test data, we know that the more complex the model uh, actually does better. But then after some point, if the model gets really complicated, then you, are, you actually start overfitting on the training data. Right, um, and one of the realization in the recent deep learning literature is that, in fact, um, if you take these deep models, which is 
So let's say if this is x-axis is complexity, it's probably lies somewhere much farther to the right. Uh, according to the first plot, those models should be really bad. They should like highly overfit on the training data and they should be really poor in terms of performance on the test data. But what people have realized that for really deep models, the whole picture actually looks like this. So yes, this part is exactly the same as this, but after, there is some point after which the more your model gets complex, it actually starts to overfit less on the training data. Um, and again, if anybody has a very clear explanation of why that happens, this is an, a topic of active research. So again, this is a very interesting problem. And if you have a, a theoretical um, understanding of why this happens, and again, that's like, uh, that would be a really strong research contribution, right? So people are still trying to understand and study this. Um, I'm gonna skip the lottery ticket hypothesis, but again, I'm just gonna leave a pointer just because I think I'm slightly behind on time. Uh, but the lottery ticket hypothesis is another very recent uh, line of work that kinda has some connections to explaining why adding depth helps. Uh, and basically it kinda relates to this idea that for any randomly initialized, but very large or complex model, there is a subset of that model that just by random chance is already uh, pretty good at the task that you're trying to uh, optimize towards. Uh, so if you are not familiar with the lottery ticket hypothesis, I definitely recommend checking out these papers. It's, it's one of the more recent papers that I really found interesting. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna skip over. Uh, super quick, uh, so this is kind of the halfway mark for us, uh, although time-wise we are a little late. Uh, but yeah, so just gonna do a quick uh, break to see if anybody has any questions before we dive into the learning to rank the core of learning to rank. No? Okay, I'm just gonna quickly grab some water, give me a second. Okay, let's then move on to the actual learning to rank uh, section. Okay, so learning to rank, uh, again, let's, um, kind of uh, describe it formally to start with, it's really simple. So the uh, some of my explanations here, by the way, uh, is kind of written from the viewpoint of search, uh, but you can think of the same thing. Uh, uh, we can talk about how the formulation changes, but it, it slightly if you're thinking of recommendation or something else. Um, so typically what you're trying to do in any ranking task is you have a set of items um, and some context, right? Uh, so the context for search could be the query, uh, for uh, recommendation tasks, for example, the context could be the user context or uh, some other context based on which you're making different recommendations. Uh, and the items are typically, let's say in search would be a document, for question answering would be answers, for recommended systems, it could be the items that you are trying to recommend. So in all of these scenarios, um, you typically represent a query document pair or a context item pair as a feature vector. Uh, a, a vector of real numbers, right? And then your ranking model's goal is to take, uh, so let's say your ranking model is F. Uh, all you wanna do is you wanna take that feature vector X and then you want to output a single score uh, for uh, that estimates how relevant uh, uh, this particular item is uh, given the current context or some other information. And our whole goal for learning to rank is how do we learn uh, this function F given some amount of training data. So we talked about uh, regression and classification already, right? So the question is, why is uh, ranking any more difficult? So the reason it turns out is that for ranking, uh, typically the kind of metrics that you care about is something like NDCG or uh, mean reciprocal rank and whatnot. Um, and there are a couple of prop basically things to kind of consider. So one is, all of these metrics are first of all very position biased. So it, they care about, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't care about what is the actual relevance estimate that your model predicts. So it doesn't care about the actual score that the model predicts. What really it cares about is once you sort the items based on the score, uh, I want to see where the uh, relevant items appear and the relevant items, uh, like the position difference at the top is much more important than let's say position difference at the later stage. So for example, if you get the relevance item at position one versus position two, that's a much bigger difference 
uh, in those between those two situations than if the relevant items appears at position nine and ten, right? In the the difference between position nine and position ten is typically like who cares because the user will probably never see it because of when they look at the search result page. But a difference in position one and two is something that we care about a lot more. The other main thing is that if you look at any of these metrics, these metrics are not really differentiable because it involves sorting. Now, the last slide of this whole talk is actually gonna be countering this whole argument and actually say that, no, it's actually possible to very closely approximate um, uh, a ranking function in a differentiable way. And it's actually one of those really simple ideas that I love that actually works quite well. So we'll get to that. That's one of the last loss functions we'll look at. Uh, but typically uh, before that, the uh, main idea, main thought process was that ranking is hard because all of the ranking metrics you're optimizing for are non-differentiable. So you have to find some kind of a proxy loss function that if you optimize for that loss function, you are also kind of optimizing for uh, the actual metric that you care about. Right, so it's all about finding uh, proxy uh, loss functions. Sorry, so, yeah. Was a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, can we look at the ranking problem as a general um, regression problem, but where the position is important? So yes. We, mm -hmm. yeah. So we can do just general like loss functions for a regression problem. Right. So. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. But we on, somehow so. look at when when the actually value are important. So mm -hmm. if we predicted higher value, that means that is in higher position in the right. rank. Yes. So that's exactly what we're going to go through. And I'm going to make a controversial statement here, which is that all ranking loss function effectively breaks down ranking either as a uh, regression or a classification task. And if you think about it, all classification tasks actually break itself down into effectively regression tasks. So, yep, it's, it's, it's a house of cards. Uh, if you know how to do regression and classification, you will realize that uh, a lot of the common ranking losses are basically formulating the ranking problem in more like a regression or a classification problem. So we'll do that in a, just in a couple of more slides. We'll exactly get into that topic. So it's good that you asked that. Okay, thank you. All right, cool. Uh, so yeah, so just some quick other uh, topics um, on the way. So like, of course, we talked about features. Um, the, every any of these machine learning models, you have some representation of the input. Uh, typically, for example, in search, uh, that features you broadly think about the features of the query, features of the document, and then features that are conditioned on both query and document. As for recommendation task, this would be uh, features for the user, features for the item, and then some joint features are conditioned on both user and item. Uh, and potentially some other context information, right? So these are typically the kind of features. Uh, here's just, again, some examples of features you might use if you are uh, doing uh, uh, learning to rank in a search situation. So for example, your features could be like TFIDF, could be like st um, static rank or page rank or popularity of the document, could be query length, and all, all of those kind of things. Okay. So now for the learning to rank loss function, and basically, by the way, the rest of the lecture uh, all is going to be about learning to rank uh, loss functions. Um, so those loss functions, uh, one way to uh, classify or, or taxonomize those loss functions is to break them into these three different um, classes. So one, the first one is pointwise, pairwise, and listwise. So pointwise is basically uh, the way to think about it is that it's kind of like regression. You basically for a query and a document, uh, you have some, the ground truth is let's say some human labels, right? So uh, you've got some human judges or editors who've looked at a query and a document or for recommendation task, a, a user and an item, and they've basically given you a label. The label could be binary, it could be graded, whatever, right? So a pointwise model is the case where the model takes um, actually, in most cases, uh, the model takes the query and the document uh, as the input uh, or a feature vector that represents the query document pair as an input. Uh, or again, for recommendation, it would be user and uh, item. Uh, and then the model predicts a score for that pair, right? So in the pointwise approach, uh, all you care about is basically trying to make the model estimate as close to the uh, ground truth labels that you have. So it's almost like a regression task. 
uh, in pairwise approaches, and we'll go into this uh, afterwards, what you do is for given a query, you take two documents, one of which is labeled higher than the other, and you basically treat it almost like a classification task, but you're trying to predict which of these documents is, uh, uh, is more relevant. Right, so if this, if you think of it as a binary class, uh, so query and document one forms class one, and query and document two, the same query, and document two forms second class, and you're trying to predict which class should win. So it's kind of like the binary classification, and we'll get into that in details in a couple of slides. Uh, List-wise approach is what gets really close to a ranking loss. So in a list-wise case, what you're doing is uh, you're trying to get as close to as possible to the ranking metric as possible. So in NDCG, um, and actually let, let's hold off any discussion, we'll get to that, uh, of uh, discussion about list-wise. So let's just do the point-wise, pair-wise first, and then we'll get to uh, the list-wise. But that's the one that's actually the closest where you make probably uh, lesser assumptions or for the formulation looks the closest to what a ranking task looks like. Okay. Uh, point wise objective. So, okay, so what do we do? So let's actually look at the uh, diagram on the right hand side. This is the simplest version. So imagine you're, uh, you got some judges or edit, human editors and they took pairs of query and document and then they gave you a five point graded label. So they said whether the, this document for this query is a perfect, excellent, good, fair, bad. Right, uh, and then you translated those uh, text labels into some numbers. So you said perfect is four, excellent is three, and uh, two, uh, and then uh, good and fair are two and one, and then bad is zero. So four, three, two, one, zero. Right. So the point was approach. So one obvious thing you could do is just treat it as a regression problem. So given the query document feature vector, your model outputs a score a real valued score, and then you just treat it as a regression loss, and then you uh, try to predict the exact value of the label, right? So if the score, if the label was three, then you're trying to predict as close to three as possible. Of course, the model might predict 2.9 or 3.1, um, but it's trying to predict exactly the same value. Um, and this is kind of problematic because if you think about it, uh, because the model is looking at a single query document pair, the perfect document uh, for, a, for query one, and if you think about the perfect document of query two, their feature distribution could be very different, right? So for one query, let's say, I don't know, um, uh, let's say a query, uh, for one query, the perfect document has 100 occurrences of the query term in the document, and a bad document has only uh, 10 occurrences of that term. In a second query, the perfect document has 10 occurrences of the query term, and a bad document has zero occurrences of the query term, right? So if your features look so very different, but then you're expecting the model in both cases to predict, let's say four for the perfect and zero for the bad, then that's a really hard task for the model to do because it doesn't understand that for different queries, the feature distribution could shift a lot, right? And there are some tricks around this, but let's not get into that. Um, I'm just trying to kind of motivate why we do pairwise in the next slide. Uh, so yeah, so this is one of the easiest version of pointwise objective, uh, but because your labels are effectively different classes, so you can also think of it as, again, if you have five different graded labels, you can think of it as a five-way classification task. So you can, your model now predicts a score for each of the classes, and your expected value is, again, one for the correct class and zero for the other labels. And then between these two things, you can do something like cross entropy with softmax, exactly as you would do for any five-way classification task. Um, or again, if you really wanted to, you could also just do a squared error between the predicted uh, vector, uh, the predicted probabilities and the actual probabilities as well, right? Um, but yeah, if it's a classification task, it makes more sense to do cross entropy with softmax. So all of these are examples of point-wise objectives where you're only looking at a single query document pair at any given point in time. Um, actually, this we already talked about. This is the classification version that we already talked about where you're doing cross entropy with softmax. So now the question is, why do we get to the pairwise? So pairwise, I already kind of gave you the example. So let's say for query one, the positive document has 100 versus negative document has 10 occurrences of the query term versus query two, where the positive document might have 10 occurrences of the query term and the negative document have, might have zero, 
right? So in these cases, it doesn't matter whether the model predicts the ex exact label correctly. What matters is that the model gives a higher score to the positive document, uh, a, a bigger score to the positive document compared to the negative document for both the queries in each of the cases independently, right? So you don't care about how the scores compare across queries. All you care about is the scores for the different documents within the context of each query independently. So this is where the pairwise idea becomes kind of useful because if you think about sorting, what are you really doing in sorting? You're basically comparing pairs of items and deciding what should be their relative order. And then you just, for example, like bubble sort, right? You're basically just comparing every possible pair and then making sure they are in the right order. Uh, so a very obvious way to think about ranking is that you're trying to learn the pairwise preference. So for every given query, you have two documents, one with a higher label, and you just want to make sure that the model gets a higher score, produces a higher score, for the more relevant document in that pair of documents and query. Um, I typically also call that just like a triple. So it's like query, positive document, negative document. Um, and yeah, so that's basically what the formulation looks like. A particular, uh, and I, I'm going to kind of skip this, basically all of the pairwise functions, loss functions becomes some function of the uh, difference of the sc uh, score that the model predicts for the two documents. Uh, for the same query. Uh, but let's talk about this in the context of a specific loss function, uh, which is rank net. So this is, I think, a very popular um, loss function. It's something um, that when it first came out, um, it actually, uh, the I forget the name of the challenge, the Yahoo Learning to Rank Challenge. Um, it did really well. And then it actually been also a bit of a uh, industry favorite, both in Bing, I know, um, in a lot of other labs as well. It's pretty much kind of like for a lot of competitions and other things, people have used rank net loss for the longest of time. Uh, so what does rank net loss doing? So again, think of, let's use some of the concepts we've already talked about from binary classification and cross entropy with softmax. Let's use those to kind of describe it. So basically what happens is you start, each training sample is a single query and two documents, where one document has higher label than the other. Right. So here, uh, so you, uh, so here you have query Q and then two documents DI and DJ. Um, I'm just checking the time. Okay. Yeah, we are good. So Q, DI and DJ. So you have two feature vectors, uh, one feature vector corresponding to query Q and DI and another feature vector corresponding to query Q and DJ, the document DJ, right? So you have two feature vectors and then you have the model, uh, you apply the same exact model with the same parameters on the two feature vectors separately. And in each case, you end up with a single score, right? Now, what you're trying to do is to make sure that let's assume that DJ is uh, more relevant than DI as indicated by the labels here. So the label here is one and this is zero. Uh, actually, this is not necessarily a label. It's basically saying uh, it's pairwise preference. So the actual labels could be that for DJ, the label is four and for DI, the label is two. Right, uh, all the expect pairwise preference. Uh, this here, what I mean is, you're just saying which of these should be ranked higher. Uh, so it becomes binary. It's one or zero, right? So it's one for DJ and zero for DI in the context of Q. So, so yeah. So your model produces a score, and then obviously you're trying to get as close to as possible as this. So what do you do? Think of it from the binary classification task. So given the raw scores, first of all, you can do a softmax on top. So that gives you like a probability. So that's the first operation. And then once you've done that, you can do cross entropy between these two distributions. So that's your cross entropy with softmax loss. So which is exactly what is rank net is. It's cross entropy with softmax loss. Uh, so if you just write it down here, um, so if you remember this, actually let's go back a whole bunch of slides and look at this. That was really long ago. Yeah, so, so you remember for cross entropy um, uh, for PQ, it was minus log Q, correct? Which is uh, if P is one for one of the classes and zero for everything else, which is true for us. So what this happen, what this means in the rank net case is this becomes minus log the probability that the model is predicting for the correct document. And by the probability, I mean after you've done the softmax. So that's exactly what you will, you can map it to when we look at this one. Uh, here. So here is the version. So minus log 
PIJ. Sorry, I'm kind of change notification, change the notation here. So here PIJ is actually what was Q before. Sorry for that. Um, but uh, here it's the uh, sorry. I'm using P bar and P instead of P and Q. So yeah. So this is exactly if you look at this one, it's exactly the same thing as we saw in the cross entropy slide, right? So uh, and for PIJ again, you can expand it to put in the softmax. So the softmax is exactly this one plus e power gamma minus si minus sj. By the way, this is just, uh, all it's doing is rearranging the softmax, which I should have mentioned here. So a softmax of the two different scores, si and sj is given by this, e power si divided by e power si plus e power sj. So if you just divide both numerator denominator with this value, then you write it like this, right? And then because it's minus log, it's kind of flipping it around. And so it just becomes log of this thing. So that's how this is a little bit of arrange, rearranging going on, but it's exactly the same thing as cross entropy with softmax that we've seen before. Uh, there's no other magic going on here. Uh, so this is for pairwise loss. But a very simple generalization would be where for each query, instead of taking two documents, you take, uh, let's say, n documents, of which one of them is the correct document that, like the most relevant document from those n. Um, so you're basically, instead of doing uh, one document versus another, you're now doing one document versus n minus one other documents, right? So out of n documents, one of them you want to predict is the positive. So that all it does is, Basically, in the softmax, in the denominator, instead of in RankNet, where you're just adding two of the uh, components, now you're going to add it for all the n components. That's all there is. So this is something that you'll run into the literature quite often, which is the generalized cross entropy loss. It's just a general version of RankNet or cross entropy with softmax loss, which we talked about already. Okay, so the last few topics that we want to cover today. So um, what are we still missing? So we got to uh, point-wise loss, then we talked about why pairwise loss makes sense. Uh, so the last question is, so what is we, what are we still missing? Uh, and we talked about this early on, right? So we talked about that in ranking, there's a question of position bias. So if you look at these two rank lists, so basically the thing here is that each of these lines is an item or a document that you're retrieving. And the gray lines are all the non-relevant items and the blue ones are the relevant items. So, and I'm giving you two different rank lists. Right, so this rank list and this rank list. So if you compute a metric like NDCG or uh, mean reciprocal rank or any of the common IR metrics, pretty much all of your metrics will tell you that the one on the left hand side is better because you get the relevant result at one, whereas here you get the rel first relevant result at position four, which is a lot worse uh, in, 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 based on most IR metrics. But if you think of pairwise uh, errors, you realize that between these two things, this particular rank list has made four pairwise errors here, but it's actually made five pairwise corrections here, right? So this relevant document has come up five positions here, whereas this relevant document has gone down four positions here. So pairwise error, if you think of it from the pairwise error or from rank net loss perspective, the right-hand side rank list is actually better. So clearly our loss function is not mirroring our metrics that we really care about as closely as we would expect, right? So we would expect that our loss function would care a lot, lot more about this than about this. Uh, so that is where the motivation comes from uh, for list-wise loss. So I'm gonna quickly go through uh, a couple of um, uh, two or three different uh, list-wise losses. Uh, so the first one is actually something that's very related to RankNet. So remember for RankNet, uh, given a query and two documents, DI and DJ, you compute the RankNet loss, right? So, la so then for Lambda rank, uh, which is a list-wise loss, all it does is it multiplies for each sample the, um, the RankNet loss with some constant uh, some delta NDCG, and we'll talk about what that, how, how you compute the delta NDCG. So basically what you do is you, at any given point during your training, you take your model. So let's say you do this after every epoch of training, right? So after every epoch, for every query, you take at all the candidate documents and you rank them according to your current uh, model, trained model, how much ever you've trained it, right? So now when you look at two documents, DI and DJ, uh, you can compute the rank net loss, but you can also look at where those two documents appear 
in the rank list based on the current model. And then you, what you can, uh, what you do is the delta NDCG is the NDCG gap if DI and DJ were to swap position in the current rank list. So let's say the DI was appears at position one and then DJ appears at position five. So, and then you can compute some delta NDCG based on this rank list, uh, sorry, some, some, some NDCG. Uh, and then you compute a new NDCG where you just swap DI and DJ. So you move DJ to position one and you put DI to position five and you compute NDCG again. And you take the difference of those two values. And then you weight your, uh, the rank net loss per sample with that value. So what, what, why is this important? Because what ends up happening is if you go back to the previous uh, case, so let's say um, in this case, the pay, uh, so if you look at these two documents, uh, what it ends up happening is, uh, so let's say if you have query Q, DI, DJ, the delta NDCG here is going to be much bigger than the delta NDCG when you compare these two, uh, the document between here and here. By the way, when I said compare documents, so I mean like you compare this gray line with this blue line and then you look at those two things swapped around. So maybe the, that gray one came down here and this blue came up here, right? So the delta NDCG here is going to be really small compared to the delta NDCG in this case. So what this is really doing is it just weighting the rank net loss function uh, by uh, some kind of an importance based on these two documents that I'm comparing, are they like at the top of the rank list or they are at the bottom of the rank list? And there's some like mathematical proofs to show why this would converge and give you something very close to NDCG. And Lambda rank is actually, again, a very popular ranking loss function that people use even today are since, what is it, like 15 years ago. It's actually still one of the most popular loss functions. Uh, actually, the probably the most popular loss function is uh, Lambda Mart, which is the, the same thing as Lambda rank, but with decision trees. Uh, so that's probably one of the most popularly used ranking uh, model in, um, across the board. Um, I'm going to skip ListNet and ListMLE because it's a bit of a more longer description. I've included it here, again, just if people are interested um, so that uh, I wanted to just at least mention so that people know this exists. And uh, I have one more slide after this, so I, let me finish that one. And then if anybody's interested to talk about ListNet and ListMLE, I can take some more time and talk about it. But I just wanted to make sure if anybody has a hard stop in a couple of minutes, then I wanted to make sure I at least cover uh, this final loss function, uh, smooth DCG, because I think this is actually a very, very simple, but also very interesting um, uh, idea that I think is worth covering. And then after that, as I said, if anybody's interested, I'm happy to stay on the call and talk about ListNet and ListMLE as well. So yeah, so let's talk about uh, smooth DCG. This is actually known by a couple of different names. Uh, one is uh, smooth DCG. There's another version I think called Aprox. DCG. Um, so basically the idea of in both of these cases is really uh, the same. Um, so think about, let's go back and challenge that question that ranking is not differentiable, right? Let's actually challenge that and see how far we can get by approximating it. So how do you figure out the rank of a document? Um, so let's say for a given query, I have 10 documents and my model produces 10 different, it predicts 10 different scores. Right. So now based on the scores uh, for document I, uh, I want to uh, and the scores of the other documents, I want to uh, I, wa I want a function F that tells me what is the rank of that document I. Right. But not doing sorting. I don't want to sort because sorting is not differentiable. So one way to do this is uh, so imagine you had a function, uh, say, G, uh, that basically tells you given two scores. Uh, it tells you, uh, it returns plus one if OI is higher than OJ and, and zero if, the, if it's the other way around, right? So let's say you have a function G that gives you one if the first score is higher and zero if the second score is higher. So what do you do? You, uh, to the rank of a document DI is basically the number of docu other documents that has a higher score. So if, if there are two other documents that have a higher score compared to DI, then the rank of DI will be three. If there are three other documents that have a score higher than DI, then the rank will be four, right? So it's one plus how many documents uh, are larger, have, have a score that higher than DI, right? That's how you effectively get the rank of the document. 
So what you end up doing in this case is that given those 10 uh, scores corresponding to the 10 documents, you do a comparison of all the document pairs. So for doc, you would compare document I to all the other documents. And then for each case, you basically have a function G that tells you one, if the, uh, if the other document has a higher score and zero if DI has a higher score. And then you just sum those numbers up, right? If you have the G output, then you just sum them up and then add a one and then you get the rank. It's all, that, all of that is differentiable. The thing that's still not differentiable is G. So G gives you a binary output zero or one based on which score is higher, right? So that's not still not differentiable, but it's possible then uh, to approximate that, and this is something people typically do in neural nets is when you have a function like that, they would approximate that with the sigmoid function. So what they would do is they would actually compute this, where here X is basically the uh, difference of the two scores, uh, and you compute the sigmoid function, which what happens is if the score is at zero, then the sigmoid function's output is 0 0.5. If BI has a score that's much higher, then the output is one. Uh, well, actually the other way around. It's, you're actually comparing, yeah. You, you, you take the other document minus the DI score. So it just flipped. So yeah, so if the difference is very high and positive, then the sigmoid function's output will get closer and closer to one. On the other hand, if the scores, uh, the difference is actually highly negative, that means DI score is higher, then the sigmoid output will get closer and closer to zero. So it becomes a smooth approximation of pairwise comparison. So now if you plug this in, what this means is that given a set of, let's say 10 scores, I can actually predict a smooth rank where let's say for a document, if its actual rank was four, I might actually predict a real valued number like 4.3 or 3.8. Uh, and there's actually a temperature parameter that you can change that if you turn the temperature really down, uh, then it actually gets very close to the actual real valued rank. Uh, so if it's four, then it will really get close to the real valued number will also get very close to four. So this trick is actually a very interesting way to go from a set of scores to the rank for those corresponding items. And once you have the rank, you can plug it into NDCG or MRR or any of those metrics, right? All of those metrics are actually, if you think about it, uh, they are just differentiable functions on top of the rank. It's, the, it's computing the rank that was not differentiable. So then once you have a smooth rank or a prox rank, you can plug it into NDCG or MRR, and that's how you get something like smooth NDCG or smooth MRR uh, and all those variations. So this is actually, if like this is something, uh, again, if anybody's interested, I can share a Jupyter notebook where you can, it's like a few lines of Python code where you can actually see how this works given some k n different scores, how you actually end up predicting those n different ranks. Uh, and it's actually quite a fun exercise to do. So if anybody's interested, we can talk about that. So that was my last slide. Uh, so I'm gonna stop. I know I'm sorry, I ran a little late. Um, Surya told me that I could cheat a little bit and go a few minutes over. So hopefully I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that, but hopefully not too bad. Uh, so yeah, any other questions before we uh, close for the day? Yeah, while uh, they think about the questions, uh, one announcement. So on Thursday, that's the day after tomorrow, we'll have another invited talk at uh, 12 noon. So this one will be by Massimo Quadrana from Pandora, and he'll be speaking about uh, session-based recommendations and sequential recommendations. Yeah, and uh, yeah, let's ask some questions to Bhaskar and uh, uh, Bhaskar, can you also speak about what you will cover in the next uh, talk? Right. So uh, I haven't decided on the exact agenda, but basically my plan right now is uh, I wanted to talk about uh, deep neural networks for, uh, for information retrieval. Um, again, given some of my background, I think I'm going to mostly be talking about um, kind of the search situation, search scenario, not as much as recommender systems. But again, I think there is uh, all of these basic concepts, I think, translates 
uh, pretty well to uh, recommendation task as well, especially if you're thinking about content based recommendation, right? So a lot of uh, the stuff I'm going to talk about is how to do uh, matching between query and document text. Uh, so uh, even in recommender systems, especially if you're doing content based recommender systems, I think the exact same problems arises. Uh, so yeah, so my plan is to uh, focus more on deep neural nets uh, and maybe cover even some of the more recent works um, that have led to a bit more like uh, pushing some of the boundaries with state of the art results and so on. Okay, great. So uh, any questions? I have a few, but I'll let others ask before. Um, uh, Sudhi, are you allowed to ask questions? Uh, yeah, I can. <laughs> um, you are, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. Uh, is there a particular reason a uh, smooth NDCG is not as popularly used compared to classic methods like Lambda Mark or rank, like some variation of stuff that Ranklip provides? <laughs> I would love to find know that answer myself. Uh, I have asked that question a lot myself. Um, I think part of it might be that it's kind of a bit of a historical reasons potentially that I don't know if I've seen any strong evidence that smooth NDCG does better than let's say Lambda rank and other things. Uh, and Lambda rank and all of those approaches came earlier. So I think there might be a bit of a historical momentum thing that I don't think smooth NDCG it, Theoretically, it looks much like a better formulation, but empirically or experimentally, it may or may not have added as much additional improvement. Um, this, however, I will actually add that more recently, I have seen a few papers um, that have started to revive this around this area of work, the smooth NDCG based. And in fact, I've recently done some work myself um, in terms of building on top of this, but I also know there are some folks at Google, um, Sebastian Brook and others who have, who've been kind of looking at this uh, base, these uh, smooth rank based approaches again. And I think there's a bunch of interesting things that people are doing. Um, so remember that once you can compute the smooth rank, you can plug it into anything, any other differentiable function. Uh, so this is where I think there is a bit of more increased interest now, uh, but yeah, I think the main reason has been that maybe they don't, they perform as well as something like RankNet, but not necessarily a lot better or anything. So that's probably it. That's my guess. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Harshita. So um, any other questions? So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk today. Um, so based on those three type of losses that you talk about, which one do you, uh, like uh, suggest to use, like which one has a better results? Oh, it definitely would be the list wise. Mm -hmm. So in list wise, the most popular uh, versions would be Lambda rank or Lambda Mart, uh, which is basically GBDT, uh, gradient boosted decision trees. Um, the list MLE listnet is not, I, 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 Okay, it's a little weird for me to make because I've clearly I'm I have my sampling or my own sampling bias, right? Like I'm um, any comment I make on which one is more popular is based on generally what I have seen or the literature that I have looked at, and this could be biased. But in my experience, I've seen maybe list MLE and ListNet are not as popular, but primarily because they're kind of computationally quite intensive. Um, uh, whereas Lambda Rank, Lambda Mart, I think they are used. Uh, quite often in practice. Um, if people are using existing toolkits or libraries or what what have you, then I think things like Lambda Rank, Lambda Mart gets used more often. When pe people implement their own uh, ranking loss functions, then I think RankNet gets used quite often because it's just very simple to implement. Uh, uh, Lambda Rank and Lambda Mart, I mean, those are also simple to implement once you know a few tricks. Uh, the Smooth Rank thing is actually super simple to implement. Uh, but I've actually realized that not a lot of people have were aware of that line of work. Um, so yeah, so list wise will definitely give you more benefit. Uh, typically would give you more benefit, probably start with something like Lambda rank or Lambda mark uh, or smooth NCG. Um, Did I, was there another question? Yeah, there? Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Um, sure. So, uh, so uh, general question. So how, when when we have like this kind of ranking problem, so when the when we look at the 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 output's gonna be a relevant relevance, mm -hmm. and the sum of them gonna be one. 
So would it be possible to use just the soft, uh, instead of softmax, we use the sigmoid mm -hmm. or last layer, and then mm -hmm. we see how much that prediction is closer to the values, the relevant values. Right. So actually, let me add another aspect to this, your previous question. Actually care about in the final IR metric. I think that's really where some, all of these things come from. Okay. So for example, there are actually cases where point wise, um, you might actually care about point wise loss. So for example, let's say, um, I'm just going to make this situation up, right? So let's imagine I have a user interface where I get um, top K candidates, but then instead of putting them as a list, I actually put them as a grid. And in the grid, each of the items is represented, um, let's say by some kind of a square or a rectangle, but the, all the rectangles are not of same area. The area is actually proportional to how relevant this item is, right? So if something is very relevant, you want to give it a bigger uh, rectangular representation in your final user interface. In that case, it's actually important not just to to get the ordering right, but to actually get the individual relevance estimates uh, correctly. So that like, you know, you know which one to give it a bigger and how much bigger it should be. So you might actually in such scenarios might actually want to do point wise loss because you are now actually making sure that the estimates themselves are meaningful and interpretable, not just the ordering of, by sorting, right? So, uh, so that's the case. Um, so for, uh, for between pairwise and listwise, so again, another situation is, for example, there are IR tasks, so let's say maybe, I don't know, like Uber or some other cases where you're not gonna show a rank list of nearby cars or something to the user, you're just gonna show them the top result. Right. Um, so there are cases where uh, there is one right result and everything else. So in such a case, list wise loss wouldn't really make sense because you just want to compare the one relevant item to everything else. Um, actually, another example of this is like if you look at uh, the track deep learning track that I mentioned in the beginning, even though the final metric we care about is NDCG, uh, the training data um, pretty much for all queries, uh, with a few exceptions, you only have positive label for like one document. So the average number of relevant documents per query is like very close to one. Um, so in those cases, again, for training, it doesn't matter if, I mean, sure, you can do listwise loss in that case, but it could be not too bad to just simply do a pairwise where you're comparing the one positive document against everything else. Right, but if you don't make any assumption in a typical rank list presentation, I would say, yeah, probably the list wise loss would be the ideal thing to do. Uh, on the question of softmax versus sigmoid, so yeah, so I mean, that kind of ties in. If you want to get a, if you care about the, the estimate in terms of its actual value, then maybe you do want to get put a sigmoid on it and then uh, do a regression style training. Um, and often that works pretty well, right? So actually, I've seen some of the more recent. Uh, work with like both style ranking models that are actually trained on point wise. Um, so I think that's, and, and that's kind of the default thing to do in that case. So clearly that works pretty well. Uh, by the way, a side note on the math, um, this is uh, maybe, this is probably hopefully very obvious to everybody, but the softmax and sigmoid functions are very related, um, especially for a softmax. If you're doing a softmax of two different numbers. Uh, so which is, for example, in case of rank net, uh, you do a softmax over the two scores that is equal equivalent to doing a sigmoid over the difference of the two scores. Uh, and this is what we looked at at some point. I just wanted to kind of, you mentioned softmax and sigmoid in the same sentence. So it kind of reminded me to mention this. So look at this. This is the softmax of the two scores, but this is actually the sigmoid function of the difference of the two scores. I just wanted to kind of point that out because once you kind of know that it just a lot of other things kind of clicks that there's between these two functions. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I, hopefully I got. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Any other questions? Surya, I was just kidding. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, yes. So <laughs> can you speak about the process of in the absence of uh, a human validated data set how do you go about getting data set for training evaluation both training yeah both let's say 
Oh, yeah. Um, okay, let's see. That's a hard question. Um, just gets a lot of money from somewhere, give it to judges and ask them to label things. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that as a half, as a joke, but honestly, that is actually like if you are actually, uh, let's say, doing a startup or you're working in industry, a lot of the time, the money you spend in doing clever things is better used by just actually getting some good labels, high quality labels. And getting high quality labels is a complete science and an art of its own. But yeah, that's a side topic. A uh, few other sources of, um, so for supervision, things that you can think about. So one is that if you actually have, again, if you are actually building a real system and then you have real users, then one approach is you start off, you um, kind of, uh, what do you say, like do a warm start by maybe using even simple IR models, but then you actually um, implement a good, uh, what do you say, instrumentation. Uh, and this is actually very key for if you're really, if you're building a real system, uh, is to have good instrumentation and collect user feedback. So you look at uh, what are the documents that people are clicking, how much time do they spend before clicking, after clicking, and so on. And there's a whole body of literature on how to interpret uh, those user behavior signals uh, into effectively some kind of a label for relevance. Um, so that would be another version. Uh, and then there is like a whole lot of other uh, kind of literature looking at distance supervision, weak supervision, or just like, you know, like you train a model for language modeling, which is effectively learning uh, term co-occurrence probabilities, and then which you can plug it into some kind of an IR model and other things. Uh, so that, yeah, that becomes another broader uh, set of, uh, approaches that people use to get uh, labels or, or supervision labels. Um, yeah, did I? Is that what you were kind of pointing to, or was there? Were you leading me to something else that I totally missed? Uh, no, just in general, because uh, one thing is it could be possible that you might have money to spend, but you might not have availability of domain experts right. to read documents and other things. Right. So as you suggested, one way of going about it is having good instrumentation and look at your user interaction logs and from that derive a good training data set and other things. And, right. yeah, and also take into, and when you do that, take into account things like position bias and as well as presentation bias and other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, and one of the things I would say is, first of all, in practice, by which I mean, if you're, let's say, participating in a competition or in an industry kind of a situation, you typically would do multiple of these things because uh, if you have multiple sources of supervision, get all of them and then figure out how to use uh, some combination of them. Uh, the other thing is that if you have a small amount of, let's say, budget for getting judgments, then typically what you want to do, uh, and, and you, let's say, have some uh, instrumented uh, user behavior data, then typically one of the trick is to use the click data or user behavior data for training, but use the a small amount of judge data for evaluation, uh, because you want a small test set with um, which is very high quality so that you make sure that your measurement is correct. And then for training, it's maybe okay to have a large amount of much more noisier data uh, to learn from. So that's like another trick that people typically do. Um, another question is, uh, should NDCG or, or MRR or the metric that you choose be tailored to the interface within which you are displaying your search results? Right. In fact, they all are. So all of the metrics have either implicitly or explicitly assumed some kind of a, a user model. So for example, in MRR, uh, which is, uh, let me actually go back just in case if anybody is not familiar with what MRR is. So MRR is nothing but, uh, so if you say you have this ranked list, it first finds the first relevant item and then the, uh, for, uh, then the metric is just one by the rank. So here it would be one by three. So it would be 0.33 or whatever, right? Uh, so here it basically, what the assumption it's making in this case is that the user, it's basically thinking the user behavior model is, uh, what is the probability that the user would even look at this position? So position one, one by one is one. So it's like probability is one. 
position two, it's the half, and then third rank is one third. So there's an implicit user behavior model that's built into uh, each of these metrics. Uh, similarly for NDCG, there is a different kind of discounting, position discounting that's going on uh, as given by this, uh, this equation, if you look into it, right? Um, so all of these metrics typically assume some kind of a, a user behavior model. Um, obviously none of them reflect necessarily the true user behavior model, um, but yeah, they are all some kind of a simplification uh, of what, what, how we think the user behaves and interacts with the search result page. So obviously now if your search result page, the UI itself is very different, uh, then obviously the user behavior model would also need to change and hence the metric would also need to change. And, and we talked about one example where the user interface is just show the top result and nothing else, right? So then in that case, the discount will be one at position one and zero everywhere else. Like there's no probability the user will see the third result because the UI doesn't even show it, so. Right, and uh, in this equation, you have uh, log to the base two i plus one where i is the position, right? Yes, yes. And. Uh, and just to be, by the way, disclaimer, the NDCG has a few different versions, um, variations. So yeah, this is one of those variants. Uh, right. And uh, uh, so this assumes that there is a DK with respect to the position. Right. And uh, let's say you have good instrumentation, then you would indeed know what the user's examination probability of each position would be. Then right. rather than using log i plus one to the base two, you can actually use the position's examination probability, right? Well, that, as, so, okay. So if you imagine you could have a, a very fancy, let's say a webcam that is staring at the user face um, well, actually not even a webcam, just assume you have a standard eye tracking system and you knew exactly if the, where the user is looking at the screen, then sure, you don't need any of these user behavior model. Um, but otherwise, what you have is, you know where the result appeared in the rank list, but you don't know if the user has actually looked at that uh, particular item or not. Um, and again, all of both the NDCG and MRR metrics are assuming that all that decides whether the user uh, looks or inspects a particular rank position is the rank position alone, but that's also not true, right? So let's say if you in two different result page, the you're looking at position three, the probability of looking at position three actually depends on what appears at position one and two. So if you have non-relevant results in position one and two, you're more likely that the user will look at position three than if there was a super relevant result at position one, then people will, the user will less likely to look at position three, right? So there are also versions of cascade uh, models and other models uh, that try to capture that. Um, I think the closest thing that has come, like, and typically what people do is they kind of assume some form for the um, for the user behavior model, but then the actual discounts, like in more recent literature or user like uh, user behavior literature, uh, they would actually learn it from the data. So they'll have some parameters in their user model, and then uh, they'll decide what the value should be to such that the uh, observed click patterns match up with what the model predicts. So you would basically learn that. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot for taking the time and uh, uh, giving the invited talk and uh, we'll see you again next week, right? Thank you. Um, I'm completely my pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, I've shared the link to the slides in the chat box and uh, I'll also send out an email to the students. With the link. Uh, uh, link to the to slide share? Yeah. All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bhaskar. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.